Howard from the Perdomo Cigar Studios on the Black Stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina, and broadcasting from down on to outside Brisbane in Australia. It's episode 138 of the Primetime Jukebox. Tonight, it's another journey down the Spotify rabbit hole. And as always, the Primetime Jukebox is brought to you by Perdomo Cigars. Awarded Nicaraguan Cigar of the Year in 2014 by Cigar Journal. The Perdomo 20th anniversary brand has consistently earned the highest scores in the industry and is a top seller in humidors around the world. The Perdomo 20th anniversary blend requires tobacco has been carefully hand-selected and are well-aged for a minimum of eight years. Perdomo 20th anniversary is offered in three distinct wrappers. A smooth, creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut. A rich, earthy Cuban seed Nicaraguan sun-grown and a dark, oily Cuban seed Nicaraguan Maduro. Combine these beautifully bourbon barrel-aged wrappers with thick, high-priming binder and filler tobaccos gives each blend a balanced complexity with layers of rich flavors and smooth, elegant aromas. Perdomo Cigar is a family-owned and operated company headquartered in Miami, Florida, with manufacturing and agricultural facilities in Estelle, Nicaragua. Perdomo's highly acclaimed Scott brands include the Perdomo 30th Anniversary, Perdomo Double Age 12-Year Vintage, Perdomo 20th Anniversary, Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary Line, Perdomo Albano Bourbon Barrel Aged, Perdomo Lot 23, Perdomo Immenso 70, and many more. For great tasting notes and pairing information, check out the Perdomo website at perdomocigars.com. And by Jerry Tobacco. The authentic Corolla leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful tobacco leaves out there. During the Golden Age, cigars are cured with a leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars. Of course, this is one of the most challenging ones to cultivate. It fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the Hamastron Valley in Honduras, Julio Aroa took on the challenge of growing Corolla from the original seed. And in 2000, he successfully reintroduced authentic Corolla back to the market. With over 50 years' experience in the tobacco business, from growing and curing tobacco to cigar production, the Jerry Tobacco Farm has been able to continue to deliver products to market with authentic Carojo. Now with Jerry Tobacco, Julio and his son Justo have brought their very own brand to market. Aladino is available to a wide variety of brands, including the latest release, the Aladino Fuminoche, and each represent the golden age of cigars from 1947 to 1961. They're available at your local retailer. Be sure to ask for Jerry Tobacco, a legacy that is tasted in every drawer. And, of course, we want to mention Altidus USA. Elevate your humidor at Altidus USA cigars. Explore top-rated classics like the H. Upman Banker Day Trader, Trinidad Spiritu Siri No. 1, Monte Cristo 1935, Anniversary Edition Diamante, and the Aging Room Quattro Nicaragua Sonata. All boasting a stellar 93 rating from Scar Aficionado. Light up, relax, and savor every puff of excellence. And finally, by Drew Estate. Dark, bold, unapologetic, black and scars on anyone by Drew Estate is an intense journey into the uncharted, deepest, darkest, and heaviest depths of Maduro tobacco. This is a masterpiece collaboration between Metallica's James Hetfield, Sweet Ember Distillings, Rob Dietrich, and Drew Estate's Jonathan Drew. The old Maduro black and scars on anyone by Drew Estate is rich and powerful, but beautifully balanced off on tantalizing notes of leather, chocolate, and espresso that's Perfect for life celebrations and times of reflection. You could find them at your Drew Diplomat retailer. And remember, all the live streaming for the primetime show, as well as the uh, studios for the uh, Thursday primetime show, sponsored exclusively by Drew Estate. Welcome, everybody. This is Primetime Jukebox, episode 138. We're in a late August edition of uh, 2024. Will Cooper, I'm back in the uh, Perdomo Scar Studios here on the Black Stage, and I'm joined uh, in the uh, other end of the, on the planet, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, in the Eastern Hemisphere, Mr. Dave Burke. Dave, yeah, you've been, uh, you've been very Northern Hemisphere lately, yeah. going all over the Northern Hemisphere. I sure have. Um, I sure have. Yep, I got back from Italy. I was uh, eleven days in Ooh. Italy. Um, I'm exhausted. Uh, from, <laughs> well, I'm not exhausted now. I was exhausted. I could tell you that. Um, and uh, you know, um, I'm not. It's one of those cases. I think I could have used the vacation from the vacation. <laughs> so before we get into the weird, the weird, uh, the weirdness and the highlights and the lowlights, yeah. but. Yep. Uh, What's the weather like there? Because I was just watching the Olympics from here, and I know it was hot yeah. at some point. So what's it like there? Um, Italy is hot in August, so that's no surprise to us. But when the locals are saying this is, like, mm. extremely hot, um, we Ooh. had 
we had, I would say, 96 to 100 degrees every day. And our trip, our trip started in Venice. Then we went to Rome for a few days. Then we came back to for a leg in Venice. So we flew in and out of Venice. And the last day when we left um, was finally it rained, which and it cooled everything down. But the bad oh, news is nice. we, we would have been in the rain. So, uh yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it was brutal. That 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 Olympic heat um, from Paris definitely was carrying over into Italy. And you know, I took a trip early this year to Dubai, and they had a record heat wave. So this must be just me Jeez. now. You know, it hits this. So uh, I don't know. Let's let's get into the coup. People want to know the highlights, the the you know the 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 weirdness. Tell us some tales of your trip here. Um. I'll save the intro trip when we do this, the intro when we do the song, like what happened, because there was ah. a, a few bizarre things. Um, but, you know, what I'll say is, um, there, you know, these were not cigar oriented trips by any means. This was more of a cultural trip. Um, so we, you know, going into Venice, um, the observations are there's no cars. OK, I mean, there's no. Car. Ah. So, you know, Venice is a bunch of islands and there's all these canals and uh, estuaries, if you call it. Um, And, um, you know, and one thing is so. So there is a mainland portion of Venice, right, where they do have the cars. But, you know, when you go to Venice, we, we think of Venice and the canals. There, There is nothing. So but the but the interesting thing is, you know, to get to the air, from the airport to Venice, where we were staying, uh, you have to take a water taxi. They are all right. They are not cheap. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. 180 bucks. Okay. 180 euros. Jeez. 180 euros, which almost like 200 bucks, right? So, um, yeah. And it's a far, it's a, it's a long, it's a high speed taxi because it's far. Okay. I want to say it's about 20 miles. It seemed like we went, right? Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, we flew, in, uh, we flew into Venice. We stayed one day in Venice. Um, and I was a little under the weather, which I'll get into that piece a little after. Um, but the next day, we had to take a train down to Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, because, again, we flew in and out of it. I had been to Rome, and I think I was telling you this, Dave, in the green room. Rome hasn't changed a bit, okay? It is time stood still. The only thing that I saw different there was the, was the street graffiti. Um, yep. And and that's I heard when I asked about that, that started during the pandemic, and some of it was commissioned and some of it was not commissioned. But uh, mm -hmm. people needed something to do to the pandemic. Apparently. Yeah, I, um, I smoked a cigar outside the Coliseum, which was on my bus. Uh, yep. Um, Saw that on uh, Facebook. So, yep. you know, let the people know the cigar. And... Perdomo 30th. Uh, Maduro. Um, I picked that because uh, I know Nick and Janine Perdomo, good friends, love love Italy. And Janine gave me some good tips on it, so I thought it was appropriate. Oh. Plus, it was 29 years since I had been to Italy, so I rounded up to 30. It made all the sense in the world. Yeah, you right? might as well, yeah. I might as well just round it up, yeah. Um, now, the plan was we were going to go smoke inside the Coliseum, okay, which which you can do. Oh. The problem is there was a problem with our, our tickets. When we, oh. we bought the tickets in advance, and uh, our ticket, we couldn't get in that day. Uh, oh no! I don't. I think they screwed something up. Literally, I mean, there was no reason. The date was right and everything, and they're saying, "Well, no, you're in. You, 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 you can't get in until tomorrow." I'm like, but the date says today, and uh, uh, we were arguing. So we said, "You know what? It's too hot to argue." So, yeah, right. um, we I smoked it outside the Coliseum. We we um we did a golf cart tour of Italy. Oh. Literally, we my wife rented a uh, a private golf cart for us with a tour guide for the whole day. Oh wow! And that's the way to do it if you want. If you're gonna go, it's expensive. Okay, it ain't cheap, right? But I tell you what, in that heat, I was sure glad to be on that golf cart, right? As <laughs> as in and out, and and the guy did a great job. He took us to all the sites of Rome you want to go. Some of the off beaten places. Uh, he took us to a place for lunch where they make the pasta right in front of you with the with the oh, hand, nice. hand make the pasta. Yeah, um, the food was unbelievable. I mean, I can just say I didn't have a bad meal there. Um, in Rome or Venice, um, we uh, we went to the Vatican as well. We did not go to St. Peter's uh, Basilica. 
Oh, okay. Um, that was my wife's call. I think he, you know, I think we assumed the museum, but we did do Sistine Chapel. Oh, over, overrated is what I'll say. Oh no! And I had done it last time I went to Italy, but my wife wanted to see it. It's, but getting to the Sistine Chapel, you go through these halls of like maps and tapestries, and that was more oh. interesting. But when you get into the Sistine Chapel, you can't even take pictures, right? So you just oh no, it. yeah, it, it's yeah. So. Um, oh, and you climb a lot of steps. That's what I'll just tell oh, you. Dear. Yeah. So uh, we did gastronomy tour as well. Uh, and I think I was telling you about that, where we go to uh, like different places. And you have little small meals. And what's nice, it's not five-star restaurants, but it's it's kind of more of a cultural feel where you get the feel for the Roman cuisine. And then we did the same in Venice. Mm-hmm. Um, Venice was great. We, uh, we stayed over by St. Mark's Square. Um, we certainly learned quickly that that's the very touristy area so we went out to the uh academic district an area called the jewish ghetto and that's a lot nicer you know in terms of being off the beaten path we did go up the, to the bell tower in saint mark square which is you get an incredible view of the city 360 mm. degrees um we went to doge's palace there um ate a lot uh pizza was incredible <laughs> there seafood's incredible in venice as well I'll say the oh, pasta is incredible in rome uh, so it was a really good trip. Uh, I, I was really glad. I had not been to Venice before, but like I said I had done Rome before. So it wasn't uh, my wife hadn't mm. done either. So, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I could go on and on, but that was pretty much the Reader's Digest version. Um, don't go in August, okay? Is, yeah. uh, so the one thing I'll say is, and there's an article on Coop that went up today on this. Um, there's not a lot of cigar stores in Italy. Yeah, he said that. It's not a lot. Now, what's easy is you see these like signs with a white T, and they're either on a blue sign or a black sign. And that ain't going to hate their tobacconists, right? But they don't really sell premium. Most of them don't sell premium cigars. So you have to use, All right. you have to use Google for that. And the problem is not only is August hot, but everyone takes vacation in Italy. So we got to the La Casa oh. del Habano in Rome, and my right. wife like budgeted time for this and everything, right? You know, because she wanted, she knew I wanted to go. We get there, I see a sign closed till August twenty seventh, oh. and and before we beat up the store, no, that's that's how that's Italy, okay? That it's culturally businesses close there, and um, it's a bad. We we knew this going there. We didn't realize when they close, it's like for two to three weeks at a time, and the one in Venice oh, right. closed as well. Now I did find a couple of cigar stores in Rome that I went to, and I bought some Toscanos there. Okay. Uh, so I bought a lighter because I needed a new light. I bought a five jet lighter. Actually, I uh, saw that. Yeah, um, there's a picture on my Facebook page of it. I don't have it with me here. It's uh, upstairs, but um, you know, it's good for my big ring. It's good for six. Yeah, all your eighties that you but, smoke. Yeah, yeah the eighties. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, what happened? I was running out of butane in my lighter, so I needed a lighter. Um, I have- well, I didn't need a lighter. I needed butane. I was like, I saw this lighter. I'm like, well. This is nice. I, I don't have to see a five jet lighter. I was, I, and uh, then when I got, you know, I read it. The reviews were actually pretty good on. It. I think it's. I think Rocky Patel imports these lighters, by the way, and rebrands mm. it with his. Because when I looked at the Rocky Patel site, they had the same lighter. It's just with the Rocky Patel name on it. All right. It was Passatori was the company though. It's a German company. Oh. Mm. So. Again, if you're going to Italy, I wouldn't plan on. There's no such thing as a cigar lounge in Rome. I think it, Rennes may have had one, but, but that was closed as well. But no, you can't smoke in, in there. So, uh, but you can find places to smoke. That's not a problem. Mm. Smoking on balconies. There's outdoor cafes you can smoke in. So you can smoke. Uh, the cafes, uh, you know, like I said, in the, but it was too hot to smoke in the cafes during the yeah. day. Yeah. So you know, it's like. Uh, <laughs> You know, but at night it was really nice. So I had places to smoke and I, I took my own. So take your own cigars is what I'll tell you. Uh, there's nothing like having a cigar on the canals of Venice. Is what I'll just tell you. It's Ooh. Cigar. Yeah. So. Uh, and the food, Great. the food I could just go on about. <laughs> so good. Oh, I can't I was uh, following you via Facebook. And the food, it's it's Rafael Nodal level. Of, I think, uh, food I pictures. think, yes, I think I did good. Okay, I think I did Raphael level food, and I think I beat him out this week. Like I, I do. So like Raphael will beat me out fifty one other weeks of the year, and he'll take it to the next level. I think there was some next level stuff. So, 
Um, yeah, it looks the whole, amazing. The lobster we got in, in, in Rome was we we ordered a lobster, my wife and I. We ordered mm. a, uh, like a, a sea bass where they actually carve it in front of you. It was, oh, Jesus. Yeah, it was really good. So, uh, In fact, the restaurant we went to that had that stuff, Raphael had been there. And, oh, wow. Well. And it's, and it's out by the Vatican. It's off the beaten path. This is oh. not like a place a lot of people won't know about. But he knew about this restaurant because he knew about the fish and everything. He's like, you have to, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, the fish is what they specialize in. And we didn't know. We, we were just given a hotel recommendation. The hotel gave us a recommendation. And we, and we said, well, you know, if it's good. And we walked around. We said, this looks like a good place. It wasn't that expensive. And it was really good. Nice. Yeah. But when we get to our song, I have a little bizarre start to the trip. Uh, this trip almost didn't happen. So when we get, but I have to talk about Ooh. it. Song, yeah. But we so I don't now, think, yeah. Now, um, one last question. I always think of this because I, 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 the only traveling I've ever done, uh, especially internationally, is when I moved from America to here. Yeah, that's it. So I always wonder, like, what's it like? English wise, like, is can you get by all right? Like, is it? Do you need to know some Italian to go there, or is it pretty all right? For the most part, it was okay. Uh, my wife knew a little Italian, but for the most part, we didn't have any uh translation problems there. A lot okay. of people spoke enough English there. There was, there was a couple of the restaurants where they didn't, but we knew enough to get by. I'll right. tell you the country I had the most problems with language barrier. All the countries I've been to is Mexico City. Mexico City. Really? Mexico City, they seem to speak the least English. That's, that's they, they, surprising. I mean, I'll never forget getting a cab. I was literally with the phone trying to translate stuff with Google on my phone. All oh, right. Yeah, but I didn't have to do any of that in Italy. So, oh, okay. Uh, so, like, when you go to some of the restaurants that are not in the tourist area, that's where we had, that's where it got a yeah. little more. But my wife knows a little Italian enough to get by, and we, we, we were fine with that. Um, so it wasn't really a problem. Right. Okay. I always, yeah. I always worry about that for whatever reason. Yeah. But Mexico city was rough. I don't know why the hotel, they spoke English fine, but any other place I went to, that was tough. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. It was tough. Yeah. Mexico city for me. And, and go figure if people have had a different experience. I want to know, but my experience was tough in Mexico city. Oh, speaking of tough, this, we might save that. I don't Well, I'm going to say it now. But you've been you've been uh, you've been on blast on the uh, cigar hustler the, the podcast. Yeah, I'm annoyed at those guys. Uh, it's just, blast. I'm not mad, I'm not, yeah, well, they've been bashing. They been they were bashing a couple of things that happened on Bear's show, and finally, I couldn't keep quiet anymore. Um, right. So, first of all, they bashed George By- Brightman, right? Who they have no clue who George Brightman is, and they're bashing the guy, right? George right. Brightman's a legend. In cigar media, okay, absolute legend. We would not be here if it's not for George Brightman. Um, and George is a really good guest, and George will talk a lot. Okay, I get that. Oh yeah. But when yeah, yeah. then then they blasted Casey Johnson for doing an interview with Bear from his car. Oh okay? right, okay. Which I didn't. Okay, there were reasons for that. Okay, if they watched the show, they would know the reasons. Okay, he. He he had an event and he just had no place to do this interview. And you know, the worst thing to do is do an event interview when it's loud in there. You don't want to do that, right? So he did the right thing. He didn't want to smoke in his car. I think it was a rental, right? So but yeah. he but he oh, yeah. it. and and they start saying that um the in the industry needs to the, the industry needs to like this like the industry needs to do better. I'm like, this guy did better. He showed up for the interview. He didn't cancel on Bear, right? And look, mm. so sometimes I think people don't realize it is noisy, but he figured that out and everything. And he did. And it was a really good interview. So I kind of just said to them, hey, you got to be kidding me. I could give I give you 50 things the industry needs to do better than Casey than that, Johnson. Yeah. Like, like, like uh, for example, and, and example, how about you guys getting your facts right, right? But this was the other thing that they pissed me off about, right? So Mike reaches out to me, right? He says, hey, you want to come on? I'll call you Monday. I said, Mike, oh, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in Europe, right? I'm in Europe. I, I can't do it. I, you know, I'm on vacation. I'm not doing it. So he says, no problem. I understand. Then they go on and say how I refuse to come on. <laughs> I, they put they put that clip out, if you know. So I I clipped out the conversation uh, with Mike. Unbelievable. Like, Mike, uh, get your facts. Can you try to get things right? 
I said I wanted I even said I want to do this. I want to have this conversation with you. But you're making it like I refuse to go on. I'm like, no, I just I wasn't going on from Italy and that was sorry. I just I had I was yeah, in a, well, yeah, it's six. It's six hours difference. And I'm enjoying my vacation. So I'm like, that's right. So it's all in good fun with those guys. But man, I, I they did. Annoy oh, me. that part. Of, that was the one that annoyed me the most is when they said I wouldn't come on. And I'm like, that's that, that is that is an out lie. To say. That's right. Boo. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so, yeah. And I and the other thing I said, if you're going to criticize Bear's show, you should really have Bear as the one who's on there. Right? Well, <laughs> like so, and those are two uh, good shows. By the way, if folks did not see the media panel that Bear media did, panel, yep. it was the ultimate media panel. Mike was on it. Mike did a great job on it. By the way, I'm not so that's not. And then the Casey Johnson interview. Casey doesn't do a lot of interviews. And I'll tell you something. He was a really good interview. I watched that one on the. I watched that one on my balcony in Rome, uh, and uh, while I was smoking a cigar, and I really, I, I. I I really enjoyed it. I thought Bear did a great job and Casey did a great job. So I thought there were two really good shows and yeah, to poke fun at those. I didn't see him poke fun, but th that was about, yeah, to say the industry needs to do better. Um, Jeez. Yeah. Uh, so. Ah, uh, well, you've had eventful vacation, eventful time back. Yeah. Uh, uh, eventful time in music coop. Yeah. Um, As we segue we, over. We got, I think you got a couple things, and then I added a couple things as well. You did. Uh, I got, I mean, there's not a ton of stuff going on at the moment. Uh, I just wanted to give, this is sort of a follow-up on a story we had when it was acquired. But remember, long ago, Pitchfork was acquired by GQ. We were sort of talking about how, you know, all of media, these especially music media, is getting eaten up by these bigger companies and yeah, what's gonna happen? And well, it's still up, and they're still doing really great reviews and stuff. So, I just want to give sort of an update on that. It looks like everything's still full steam ahead. It hasn't really been. I mean, the fear was that it was gonna get rolled into GQ, and it wasn't gonna year one be a thing. Year, yeah. So yeah, year two is when I get worried about that stuff, or when a little time goes by when they have to absorb it. So that's the part I'm worried about. Yeah. Yeah. But for now, anyway, people should still check that site out and everything. I mean, like Coop said, who knows what's going to happen in the future? But yeah, as I mean, of now, it's still sort of running as is. I'm a, I use Pitchfork. Uh, I do a lot of my background. You know, I, you know, I read reviews too on music, and mm. you know, it's a it's a really Pitchfork to me has been like a very important site. So so far, so good. Uh, I'm glad they didn't go out of business, but uh, I am worried. Yes, I am worried about this. Yeah, I think the fear at the time was that it'll just get sort of eaten up by the magazine and just be like yeah. <clears throat> a segment on GQ as opposed to yeah. a site all on its own. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Um, but I just wanted to give sort of an update on that. Uh, very musical closing to the Olympics, Coop. We had Snoop Dre, Red Hot. And I knew this was sort of, they needed something West Coast because of the because of the Olympics, so they had Snoop Dre, obviously, Red Hot Chili Peppers, the Billie Eilish, which is interesting. Um, so very musical closing, and then Tom Cruise on a motorcycle or whatever. So it'd be interesting to see what the opening is like. I didn't get uh, if they go that route. Yeah, I didn't get to see it because um we were out when it was taking place because we were in in mm -hmm. Europe. And my Peacock subscription didn't work in Europe. So All right. I still want to watch that, and I will, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for openings and closings, they do like to have kind of a musical act. So there's a lot to this one, kind of psyching up the uh, Olympics heading to L.A. So Yeah, I thought but. they would have had Alison Moyet somehow, and I don't know if she was in it or not. She's a pretty big French uh, pop star. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I didn't see her at the opening. I could be wrong. No. But I was a little surprised on that because she's still very popular in France. Yeah, I mean, I expect America to be very sort of like musical and very big. So I think music wise, I think that opening ceremony will be quite. I, ho I hope some of the LA rock scenes in, in there too. I mean, I think it should be I West Coast. 
Yeah, I would hope to see a little of that in there. Um, I mean, going off of the closing, they're gonna. I mean, it's gonna be probably a lot of West Coast hip hop, and then uh, you know the um, the because LA has a big rock scene, so you think so? Yeah, I think. Um, anyway. So that's the Olympics. And you got some uh, new stuff that I did not have on there. Yeah, so a uh, couple of things happening. Uh, Music-wise, Herb Albert, okay? Uh, Herb Albert, the, the trumpeter, uh, but he's also a musician, songwriter, record producer. Even he's a painter and sculptor, but he's also the co-founder of A&M Records as well. Yes. Um, Herb Albert, I'm a huge fan of Herb Albert. He's putting out his six, uh, 50th album next month. It's called 50. Wow. Now, Herb Albert is touring, right? Herb is he? Al- yeah. Herb Albert is 89 years old. Jeez. So, um, he, I mean, he, look, Herb Albert, people don't realize he's a monster, okay? I just mentioned that. He's won Grammy. He's, he's won eight Grammys. He's got a Lifetime Achievement Award. He has got a Tony Award. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's got, a. Uh, uh, he's been honored. I think he was Kennedy Center or National Medal of Arts, one or two. So I mean, he's been on. Uh, and he, I'm a huge fan of his music, by the way, though him and the Tijuana Brass. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, he's 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 forwayed into a lot of different areas. I remember he did the the song with Janet Jackson. Uh, he's famous for that trumpet solo and rise, and um, you know, the guys in love with you, uh, where he actually sings on that one. So uh, I'm really excited about that album coming out uh, for sure. Right, 89 mm. years old, this guy, and he's tour. He's still touring. That's what's amazing. He is. Still yeah, that's touring. like. Yeah, that's like if like Willie, if Willie was touring. That's yeah. So God bless her, Albert, man. Um, oh like, yeah, 89 years old, and he'll be 90 in March 31st. So uh, it's only you know it's yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. On the uh, on the uh, of course there were a couple of music deaths. Uh, Greg Kin of the Greg Kin Band. I think I would say mm. Greg Kin had this cult following. Um, he passed away. Uh, he was in his seventies. He's known for uh, two things: the breakup song, yep. and and Jeopardy are his two things. So, mm-hmm. uh, he passed away. Um, when I was in Italy, and then. Earlier this week, Jack Russell, who was the lead vocalist for Great White, mm-hmm. um, he had the same birthday as me actually, December fifth. Uh, really? Yep. Yep. He is famous for these. Uh, they were famous for the song "Once Bitten, Twice Shy." Yep. Which is kind of interesting. They had an album called "Once Bitten," and then they had an album called "Twice Shy," but they have a song called "Once Bitten, Twice Shy" that was on the <laughs> "Twice Shy" album. That's a big hit. The other one's "Rock Me." I think people may have heard that. Uh, Great White had a, I think Great White kind of got, uh, squeezed out when the whole top 40 thing imploded in the early 90s. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah But, but they was, they had, they had, uh, they had some success in the late 80s. So, uh, Jack Russell, uh, I think he was in his 60s, uh, when he passed away. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I heard, I heard about that one. Um, yep. Yeah, great white. That brings back memories, man. Yeah, once bit and twice. Yeah, yeah. And, right. and Jack Russell had a very distinct voice. He 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 had that L.A. We talked about the L.A. Mm. music, L.A. type of uh, hard rock kind of gravelly voice that was in there. It worked out well. It was slightly gravelly, not very gravelly. Yeah, yeah. Don't say I don't know. Coop's a big uh, L.A. rock scene guy. Yeah. you're a, you're a L.A. Guns guy, weren't you? Oh yeah. Do you know that there was a yeah there was a guy who almost who was lead singer for a while he lost he was the runner up for rock star in excess his name was Marty Casey he lost he was not the right fit for in excess I'll say this but no. for a while he was in one of the incarnations of L A Guns as the lead singer he's a really good LA vocalist Guns, man. he's just not he was not in excess material unfortunately so he's more of an L A type of sound he's got he's really good so yeah he was with uh but you know L A Guns that's the whole Tracy Guns thing and everything yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh let's yeah. get back there. Mm-hmm. Now cigar news. I'll leave this up to you. Yeah. Um Coop? yeah, there was a couple of stories that came out. Um so the big news is coming out of Esteban Diesel's factory. So yes he, earlier in the year, I think we were talking about this that Esteban Diesel, people know he left uh Nica Sueño. 
Uh, you know, so him and Skip split, and he opened up his own factory, Tabacalera Familia Diesel. Uh, and he's partnering with a guy named Daniel Lance of um, Domain Cigars. By the way, Aaron and I are high on these Domain Cigars. Loomis likes these cigars. Um, one of the cigars, Loomis is the highest score of the year. So really, so, yeah. There's, you know, we know what Esteban Diesel is capable of doing. Okay, he's a he's a hell of a blender, you know. So, um, but they've basically expanded the team, and they brought two key people on the team. Um, the first is they he brought his brother Raúl Diesel, who's been working in the Noxa factory. Um, and you know, Noxa's primarily a lot of people may know that's where Dumbarton makes the Micarita mm-hmm. line. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a few other things that are made there. Um, Dapper Cigars is made there. Some of the Crown Head okay. stuff is now, you know, is coming out of there as well. Like Le Petitier comes out of there. Uh, the Coronet, one of the Coronetta blends comes out of there. But uh, Raul has now joined the Tobacco Lara Familia Diesel team with his brother. What's not clear, and I haven't been able to get an answer, is he gone from Noxa or not? That's the part I don't know. But we do know he is part of the team now at the, at his brother's factory. And then the other guy who joined, and this is a name people may not know, but it's an important name. Uh, this guy by the name of Kevin Baxter. He is a guy out of Kansas City. What people may not know about Kevin Baxter, he co-founded mm-hmm. Asylum with Tom Lazuka. He was involved with the launch of that company. He created some of the blends. Uh, he's he's very much a hands-on blender guy. I. He left very, very early on, Kevin. I don't know what happened, but Kevin kind of just uh, was gone. And then he started doing what uh, they call ghost blending, where he was just blending cigars Ooh. for people at different factories. So then, and Daniel Lance, who's Esteban's partners from the Kansas City area, he brought in Kevin. Um, so now Kevin's a part of his team. It sounds like Kevin's also going to get his own brand of cigars as well. Oh. Um, I so I I like the work that Kevin's done, so I think this is a very very good move. And they're calling this like these uh, the two Diesel brothers and Kevin. They're calling it the residency, is what they're calling it. Oh, all right. Yeah. So, uh, I I said if Loomis likes a cigar, you know that this factory is is probably doing some good stuff. Mm. I like it too. The, the the one the, they did a Maduro and a natural. I like them. We Aaron and I really both like the Maduro. Yeah, he said that. Yeah. yeah. The other... That's interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh no, I just said it's interesting, and I and I'm interested to have more of his cigars. Yeah, yeah. They also created a the other thing that came out is they created a new strain, a new hybrid tobacco as well. It sounds like a new Corojo variant. So they're doing. We had Daniel on the show a couple of months ago, and he's. I'm telling you, this there's a lot of vision what these guys have. So they're not. He Daniel didn't get into this to just slap a brand on a cigar he's you know he's, he's all in this guy uh and he's a great guy by the way um mm. all right we got some cao news yes um cao has created a cigar called the cao arcana thunder smoke mm. it's named after some area in africa and this is what's important this blend has an all african filler so it's got cameroon mm. tobacco it's got Zimbabwe tobacco, and it's got South African tobacco. So CAO is saying this is the first blend to use South African tobacco, at least first major release. Um, and it's the first blend to use three different African tobaccos. Okay. Um, Cam- African tobacco is not common as filler, typically because it's expensive. But we mm. started uh, we started seeing it happen. Uh, Christoph did. Uh, the um, guardrail, which had the Zimbabwe tobacco, and I think they were the first. And then um, Justo Aurora has created the Aladino Cameroon Reserva, which is a Cameroon, it's all Cameroon tobacco, but it's grown in Honduras. Right. So, so yeah, this is interesting. Um, so, usually I get excited about this stuff, and it lets me down, though. So, ah! <laughs> so we'll see what happens with that. Uh mm. I just sat on a nail or something, I think. Oh, Coop. Yeah, it was like, yeah, there was, a nail, on, there was a nail on this chair. <laughs> something. I just kicked it off. So, all right. So, so yeah, that, that, um, that was, so yeah, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, like, I think they're sending us some. So, Dave, I'll get you them when we get them. Yeah, let's check it out. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I'm always willing to give those things a try. Like you said, you know, sometimes they're a hit, sometimes they miss. But you yeah, know. yeah. Um, review of the week, Coop. Developing pallets. Oh boy, the boys are at it again. Well, I want so I saw the Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust Brulee Wagashi uh, show. Um, which. First of all, love the headband on Surgeon. You gotta see it. Oh boy, it's got, like a got the it's, headband. Yeah, it's like the Bruce Lee hairband. Is it like a Bruce? Yeah, it's very yeah. Uh, so I now I never really got into the brulee. I know some people did. I I, I don't know what about it, Coop. I never really got into it. Um, this is I didn't need the I, uh... dojo cigar, I believe. I like the blue. I like the blue. I shouldn't say it. Yeah. It's yeah. a dojo cigar. Mint green, which I agree with. Tuna likes the mint green. I agree. Oh, I, I, I agree with him. I think the problem, he nailed it. The font. Yeah, I understand he got put the dojo in him, the but they should have kept yeah. the font like like Sober made. It, it just looks bad with that part, but it, it, the mint green looks great. Mint uh, green looks give, great. Yeah, yeah. They did a nice job with the packaging on that part. Yeah. Now, I've always associated the brulee with like being overly sweet or the sweetness of it. Yeah. Um. And Tuna was talking about it had like a barbecue note to it. I was like, really? And so I, which I never really have associated. I've smoked I never, this cigar. Yeah. And I got to go back and I, when I heard this, I got to go back and smoke it. Yeah. I've never really associated that with a brulee cigar. So, uh, so it got me interested to check it out. So I just want to know your thoughts on it. I haven't had and especially this barbecue note, I found surprising. Yeah. Um. I actually took a one of these cigars to Italy, and unfortunately, it cracked, so it was oh, unsmokable. No. Yeah. So, um, I have smoked this cigar before, but I haven't reviewed it. So I, I actually just ordered some more, right, to replace, so I could do the review. Um, I was disappointed with this cigar. Um, I did now the barbecue note. I smoked this the two times I smoked it weren't in it was kind of more one was with my neighbor who had one and the other one uh was at the show. It was very uh, mild, this cigar, from what I remember. Okay. And all I kept saying is it's not as good as a blue and it's not as good as a regular sober mesa. Mm-hmm. Um and it was like seventeen ninety five. So Yeah. Now it's not a dog rocket, but like I said, when I compare it to the other ones, does it do anything? No. Uh, mm-hmm. I thought the box pressing made it a little more air. It was a very light cigar. Blue had a little more body to it. Okay. This one, this one, I thought was the lightest of the. If you take Sober Mesa, Blue, and the Wagashi, this was the mildest of the three. I thought. So now I got because it's mild. I probably wasn't thinking of this note or concentrating on it, so I want to go back and smoke mm. it and see what, what we think on it. Uh, I thought the score was a little higher than I would have expected them to have on this one. Mm. Yeah, I like I said, I mean, I've never been a huge fan of that, of the brulee, but I'd give it a try. Yeah, they were um, talking about another cigar at a Hoya. Oh, it was the Hoya, it was the Cabanetta that they were mm. getting that barbecue note as well. Mm. And I have that one as well, so I got I got to smoke that and see. Because I don't I know, love, I don't know if they, I, I don't think there's any fire cured in it. No, I mean not that. I mean I, they didn't mention any. Yeah. Um, but I love I love that sort of fire cured. Like Sam Lacey used to do a good fire cured cigar. Well, like, and, yes, they were talking about that. Um, and and George Rico, who did I think the best fire cured cigar I've had to date, which is the American Puro. It was all American tobaccos. Uh, and I thought that was the best one. Uh, I think Bear and I agree on that one. But Sam's was very good. That came very out good. of uh, that came out of the factory by Casa Cuevas, uh, Las Lavas, and they have a blend called uh, Sangre Nueva, which mm. has fire cured in it. That's probably another really good one as well. I think it's an acquired taste, the fire cured, like. With I some smoked, cigars, either either into it or you're not. I think smoked a lot in Italy. I bought I was like, um, the Toscanos are good. Some are better than others. They'll never get like 95 points, you know. 
No. I mean, it's even hard for them to get 90s. They're not very complex is what I find those Toscanos. They tend to not do well on the coupe scoring, but they're good cigars. Pairing of the week. We haven't done this in a while. I had the Dirty Rat. I've been into the Dirty Rat lately, Coop. Yes. Uh, I had the Dirty Rat, and I listened to the song Shotgun by Soccer Mommy, which yes. then led me to Valentine by Snail Mail. So I had a bit of an indie woman singer-songwriter night. Um, when we'll get to why I was listening to Soccer, Soccer Mommy by the end of the show, but yeah, Soccer Mommy definitely had an appearance. No, yes, yes. Uh, good song by her, by the way, Shotgun. Oh, love that Love that song. Um, Coop, can you use Coop's pairing of the week is far more impressive than mine. Okay. Um, when I went to Italy, I mentioned I smoked a cigar at the uh, Coliseum, um, which was the promo with Ernie Dine for his Maduro. One of my favorite cigars of the year. I mentioned, again, promos go to Italy. They love Italy. Um, uh, Janine helped me out with some stuff with Italy. And then on top of that, uh, it was close to 29 years since I've been there. But I took more than one, right? Because uh, just in case something happened, I, I knew I was going to smoke that cigar at the Coliseum. So I took five of them. So um, that night, um, I went, you know, I went back to the um, the uh, hotel and I had my midnight smoke on the balcony. And oh, yeah. uh, I it was in Rome. Now Billy Joel has a song called "When in Rome" Ooh. from the storefront. <laughs> well, from, you know. The Stormfront album, which is the one that had We Didn't Start the Fire, they released like seven singles out of ten. And When in Rome is easily the second best song on that album, right? It's got a little bit of that vibe from uh, the Innocent Man album with that 50s vibe a bit. It's All a great right. song. So I'm listening to that smoking the Perdomo. I'm like, hey. I'm When in Rome. I, I had to play it. Life doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, I had to play it a little low because I was on the balcony at midnight. But, you know, I had my, oh, I worked sure. my, hey. I had my laptop at work good. Yeah, so uh, went in Rome, smoke. <laughs> Love it. Yep, so that was my, oh. I said, I said uh, this is definitely my pairing. <laughs> That's how it's going to be the best pairing ever. Yep, yep. There you go, hi, tap that. Yeah. Um, right, so now Coop will probably, we're going to have to give us the info on this, but we're both, we're doing a uh, Spotify rabbit hole cigar. Um, and we're both doing the same cigar this time, which is uh, the CLE 2023 PCA exclusive. Yeah. Um, which Coop, Coop sent me. Yep. Uh, nice originally, week. I thought I was out of these, and I had one more. I said, Dave, I got one more. We could do it, right? So, uh, so CLE's probably been the company that's done the best job with the PCA exclusives, right? They try mm -hmm. to create some... Uh, some some different they do try to do some different types of things right so this is a cigar and I the problem and I I've had some I've had this cigar good and I've had it not as good right I think I spoke to one on a show actually mm. um and I I know I spoke to a Christian but when the review the review only got an eighty seven I'm still trying to figure out why but uh but you know I it's not you know not a bad score right. But it's kind of gone up and down with me. But here's the thing. There's this mystery tobacco in this blend. So, it's, mm -hmm. um, so they did three PCA exclusives, and they put the mystery tobacco in all three of the PCA exclusives. They use it in the 2023, and I believe it's again in the 2024 one, right? So they did a, they did a, they did an Asylum one, right? Um, which the Asylum one, I believe, is a, uh, a Maduro. Then they mm. did a uh, Aroa one, PC exclusive, which is using a Corojo wrapper. Uh, and then they did a CLE one, which uses a Connecticut shade wrapper. Right. Uh, but the mystery tobacco is in the filler, and it's from some farm that they're saying is in South America. Okay. Now. There's a town. We have kind of, we don't, we have not confirmed this. So this is speculation, okay? Well, here we go. Bear has suggested that this tobacco has been Argentinian from the beginning. Okay. I don't know why he kept saying Argentina, right? Well, and I didn't, you know, I didn't really think much of that. But then they, we know that Justin Andrews took a trip to Argentina with Tom Lazuka. All right. So we believe that Ooh. we're inferring that so he put, took, they yeah. went to, they didn't go to Argentina to go eat steak, right? Just hang out. Right, yeah. right. So we're kind of inferring that it could be Argentina where 
this is grown as tobacco. Um, okay. There were a couple of companies that told me a few years. I don't want to say who the companies were, but there were a couple of companies told me they were experimenting with the Argentinian tobacco. Now, the reason why we think it's Argentina is it. There's something we in Bombay use Paraguayan tobacco, mm-hmm. and Paraguay is like right near Argentina, so we we think it's it, and it's kind of there's kind of a distinct taste to this. I won't give it away. You either Ooh. don't like it, you don't like it, Dave. So. Uh, it's been a little inconsistent with me. At times, I smoke better than other times. So we'll see how this goes. So let's get very excited. Paper sleeve, ba- the baby blue. You know, the baby blue is interesting. Uh, it, I think it works with this cigar actually. Mm-hmm. Um, it's um, maybe I would have made it a shade darker, but it doesn't look bad against the Connecticut wrapper. No, doesn't yeah. look bad. So I'm gonna fire mine up. But again, there's no, they have not disclosed that this is Argentinian tobacco. This is just me speculating. It's just speculating. And uh, I'm sure if I ask them, they'll deny everything. Ah, probably. Well, but, I will. Yeah. I can see thinking it's a boy cigar. It just looks like the, the problem is the baby boots look too much because oh. it's a boy cigar. That's why I maybe would have made a shit, but it looks nice. I think it looks nice. Yeah. Um, so we're doing Spotify Rabbit Hole because it was easy prep for Coop after. Yep. Holidays and it's always fun to do. Yeah. So is... Coop. Yep. Oh, go ahead. Yep. No, I uh it was and it's kind of our way of being a DJ for the day. So it's right. it. So it's it's fun. Yep. So for the just a review for people, Coop and I start with the same song. It was her's turn to pick. Yep. So he picked the song, we both start with it, and then we both listen to Spotify and we go to whatever comes to mind. Whatever comes to mind, and we write it down in real time. We each have 10 songs, uh, excluding this song, so 11 songs, I guess. Yep. Um, And, uh, yeah, Coop, so why don't you let the people know what we start off with and why you uh, chose that one. Okay. Um. This one, Um. all right, the song, I'll tell you what the song is, just, and I'll tell you why I picked it. Uh, the song is called "I Can See Clearly Now" by Johnny Nash. Uh, this great was a song. This was, it's a great song. It's kind of got a little reggae vibe to it. In fact, Jimmy Cliff did a more reggae version of it, right? He um, did. Yeah. Of this song. This was my favorite song as a kid. Like, and my mom ah. would play this song, and I loved this song as a kid, right? But it kind of played into my trip. So there were oh, two. I had two things against me on this trip when we left. Uh, I got the flu the week of the trip. Oh, I mean, it was I was on medication, Tamiflu and all, right? It, it, you know, COVID would have been a lot worse, right? If it was COVID, right? Mm. But so I didn't even know if I can go on this trip, right? Like I didn't. It was it was Thursday. We leave on Friday. Um, that that was, you know. But the other thing that was going on is it was a tropical storm, uh, Debbie, that was coming up the coast during and literally. They said it was going to jump seven to eight inches of rain on Charlotte, right? Jeez. If that, if that would have happened, we would not have gotten out. It's just Charlotte is – it's no city's really equipped. That's a deluge of rain. Yeah. Uh, and this thing was going up the coast as we're flying up to Philadelphia for our flight to Venice. Uh, right. Well, the storm went east of Philly and went west of – east of Charlotte and west of Philly. Um. So we made it out. The rain, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Right? <laughs> uh, I i can remove all the obstacles in my way. I, I was lying in that song, right? Perfect song is what I picked with this. Nice. Yep. So Coop's got the song, made it out on holiday. What is your first song after this? Okay. Um, Rain. I went with the mm-hmm. rain theme, okay? Um, And there's a lot of songs with rain. There are a lot. But there's one that is just, it's more, it's my all-time favorite song with the word rain in. And that is Led Zeppelin's Fool in the Rain from uh. the best Led Zeppelin album, In Through the Outdoor. Yeah, Coop loves uh, In Through the Outdoor. Yeah, this song is a masterpiece and uh, 
It, oh, it's a great it was song. something. Uh, look, it was so un Led Zeppelin like, but I love what they did with this. This has a little bit of a Latin vibe, a Caribbean vibe to oh, it. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, kind of the Caribbean vibe kind of ties in with the whole Johnny Nash stuff. Uh, yeah. So yeah, nice. I I uh I went with that. It was like I said, I just kept with the rain theme. I kept it easy. Uh, this was an mm. easy. This this one came to me. Within like thirty seconds, so after, oh, after would, yeah. the exercise, yeah, it was pretty easy. Nice work. Yeah, I went. So, what I love about the Giant Nash song, and similar to you, Coop, when I was growing up, I heard it everywhere. I it was just sort of everywhere. I don't know if it was in a movie hey, around the time or what. It's a feel good song too. It, it's a song that makes you feel good. It's not, you know, it's nothing. It's a good song, yeah. But you hear, but like it was just kind of everywhere. Um. But I love the vocal on it. And another person that I love the vocal on is Sam Cooke. Oh, yeah. So I went, Sam Cooke, a change is going to come. Um, we, don't, we don't talk we, enough about we don't talk enough about Sam Cooke on this show. Sam Cooke? No. Yeah. No. Uh, you want to do feuds. What was it hit Sam Cooke and um, uh, oh, he had a he had a food feud with someone. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, who does a uh 110th Street? Who does that song? Oh, uh, I'm gonna Google it. Across 110th Street. I'm gonna have to look it up now, Coop, because it escaped my mind. Bobby Womack. Uh, Bobby Womack. Yes, I love Bobby. Yeah, he had a feud with Bobby Womack. I didn't know that. Big feud. I believe. Really? Yes, but I will. I will uh, look into that further. Yeah, we'll go to our future if, show. But if we ever anyway. do our future, we were talking about reviving the whole, you know, rivals thing. Yeah, I thought it was a great. All show. because he married. I'm just going. He married uh, Sam Cooke's wife. He did something, like, but he no. But he married. He said he married Sam. He married his close friend Sam Cooke's wife two months after Sam died. Yeah, that's not good. But Womack, uh, I think he had an affair with their daughter or something like that. It was it's not. It... <laughs> It's We're gonna have to look good. at that more. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm. I'm kind of just googling this real quick. But I do. I did know the the wife thing. Anyway, this cigar is incredible. But anyway. Oh yes, yeah, you. you um, oh my god. So it's, it's smoking. Like I said, there's a there's a but there's a note right. You're getting. You, yeah. you may be getting that note. You're getting some of that tobacco for sure. Oh, it's so good. It's like a light barbecue note. It's like kind of a light charred note. A little bit, oh. yeah. A little charred. A little charred. It's, well. it's not, and then I'll get back to the song, but I think when you when you, when you you look at the cigar, right, you're expecting creamy, buttery, that you're sort not, of thing. You're not going to get that. It ain't that. that. It's, it's a little bit of a musty barbecue note. So, as well. good. so but, good. But there's also a little bit of a sweetness you get from, from this, too. Oh. I get a little cream, but not a lot. No, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's it it. There's more. Oh, so good. There's more of a full-bodied, meaty note to it than you'd expect from looking at it. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, like there's more expect, body. You're not gonna go out yeah. nicotine off this, but yeah. No. Yeah. Uh. Anyway. Anyhow. Uh. I. Uh. Uh. Oh, we got your next one. We just did feuds. What do you got? Yeah. What do you got next? I went Sam Cook. Okay, you went Sam Cook. You went Zep. Yep, I went Zep uh, with the rain theme. When you listen to Fool in the Rain, mm. there's that jam. Okay, there's that jam in the middle of the song. It's kind of like a calypso. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, Caribbean type. Dun, and and you're, as you're mm. listening to it, there's a part that sounds like a uh, a little bit of a a, a little bit of La Bamba. So, and I've always, when I heard La Bamba for the first time, and I remember when it was like really, uh, I, you know, it was a few years later because I wasn't really into Richie Valens when this song came out. Mm. Uh, and then when Los Lobos did it, mm. Los Lobos did it, it was much more that led, it, it sounded like literally you would think that. Led Zeppelin sampled Ghost Lobos in that part. So I picked mm. La Bamba, the Ghost Lobos version. Ghost Lobos Richie version. Richie Valen, yeah. Uh, which was a huge hit in the 80s. So yeah, I kind of just took that and said, 
it's it's close. I, I can see them. I could even see if Led Zeppelin was playing this live, I could see them going right into La Bamba. You know, it's kind of like something like that. Yeah. So, so I went with Los Lobos, La Bamba. Uh, I kind of, yeah, so it's kind of a weird t- path I'm taking. Hey, Los Lobos, very underrated band. Great Christmas. They did a great Christmas. I think we talked about that on one of the shows one year. Great Christmas album they've done. Yeah. Underrated. Uh, Mexican band, yeah. No, they're great. Um, let's have a look here. So you went that. I, I, I mean, it's sort of chalky, but then I'm listening to Sam Cooke, A Change Is Gonna Come. And so the next song I went to is obviously Aretha Franklin's A Change Is Gonna Come. There you go. Uh, which is interesting to hear back to back. It's got, I mean, there's a lot of gospel vibe in Sam's version. I think even more so in Aretha Franklin's version. Uh, this was a big, the song was huge to the civil rights movement. Um, lots of talking about, you know, issues of race, uh, obviously with the like title and everything. Uh, it's just a great song. She covered it. This is back in the era. Cooper and I have talked about this before. Sort of that like soul music of this era, like Motown, and even though yeah. you know, they weren't Motown or she wasn't Motown, but it was just like, People would do a song and there'd be a cover of it like two months later, and you would not know like which one's the cover and which one's not. Yeah. And songs were getting covered like quite rapidly. So uh this is an example of that. Like Aretha Franklin's done stuff with Sam Cook and um yeah. covered this song. It's a great track. I love the organ on it. Uh I love this this version of it. Uh so yeah, went went to went with Aretha. Can't go wrong. Which yeah, I like Which that. I think these uh, songs are so close together. I bet yeah. some people think that this is the original. Yeah. No, I agree. They're not that f- far apart. No, then I don't know how many years apart they are. That's a good question. I mean, now people cover songs now that were in like the 70s. Like we're talking about people covering songs that was like six months ago. Yeah, and I think we talked about that. That was a lot more common when you got into the 50s and 60s that you'd hear yeah. covers very quickly. It was just that's how it was back then. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I was just trying to look that out real quick. So I'm kind of... Uh, yeah, 64 sort of... with Sam Cooke. Um, 60, 67, I think, was Aretha. I think you're so right. It's pretty close, really. Yep. This like I said, a... now you get people covering songs that are from like like Fast Car, right? Yeah. That was like sixty seven was a reason. Thirty yeah. years ago or something. Yeah. But the same so, yeah. one actually was I I was just looking at it. It was voted number twelve on one of the old Rolling Stone five hundred greatest songs list. Oh no, it was number three on the one the twenty twenty one one which we did. Sam Cookman, my friend. Yeah, this is this is a big song. So yeah, this is a very yeah, and uh, you know, like I said, it's an anthem to a lot of stuff. That that was a bit, you know, yeah. So we are usually Coop and I diverge after a bit. We are we are quite different right now. Yeah, but I think we're getting back. I, here's what's interesting. So I think we may be a little closer in terms of errors right now. Okay. So I went chalk with this one. Okay. La Bamba, we, I talked, it's the Los Lobos version, but uh, La Bamba is known with Richie Valens. Mm. Richie Valens was in the famous plane crash with uh, Buddy Holly mm. and the Big Bopper. Um, I went with Buddy Holly. Uh, uh, that will be the day. Oh, great song. I went, I went back to Buddy Holly. This is old school rockabilly. Um, oh, yeah. But, you know, that Buddy Holly story movie is a gr- and and the La Bamba movie, but I think the the Buddy Holly story movie that they did in the late seventies, Gary Boosie gives yep. an epic epic performance as Buddy Holly. By the way, should have got the Oscar for it. Uh, one of the great performances I ever saw, and uh, yeah, but Buddy Holly, uh, that will be the day. Um, I always wonder if Buddy Holly would have lived what we would have seen from him. Uh, in, in, oh, in, definitely. I think we would have seen a massive, like, decades-long career with him. Mm. He just didn't get enough of it. 
his career of that. Yeah. So no. Uh, yeah, and that's his, that's one of Buddy Holly's. But it's very much a rockabilly song. I went into. Oh, definitely. Like, yeah. So. so yeah, Buddy, Buddy Holly and the Crickets. So, Buddy Holly and the Crickets. Yeah. Can't forget the Crickets. No classic, yeah. classic well, and the. Yeah, so we, we, you and I are both pretty far in the past right now with, with our rabbit holes so far. Well, I'm going to stay there, Coop. Yeah. Because uh, I was in sort of like a uh, civil rights song vibe. Mm-hmm. And I went with Marvin Gaye, Inner City Blues. Oh, what a great song. Oh, that's a great song. Great song. One of the best albums ever recorded, if not the best album ever recorded. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, but just the album, which, I mean, it's songs like this. And what's good this off the what's going on album songs like this that uh Barry Gordy were was afraid of releasing because he's like, Well, this is too socially active, no one's gonna buy it. Yeah. And it end up selling like the biggest selling Motown record ever. Um but you know, this is where Marvin Gaye in What's Going On, he's sort of focusing more on the Vietnam War. This he turns his focus to issues at home in the US, and it's a lot of commentary on race, class, police brutality. Um, and this sort of starts what's going to get picked up later in my next song. This sort of focus by African American artists back on issues within the inner city that wasn't really getting covered in music at the time. Yeah. Like he had a lot of protest music, but a lot of that music was around protesting the war. And you had some civil rights stuff, but Marvin is bringing this, those those bigger issues back to like, you know, what what's the real life for people now? Um, and Inner City Blues does that. Yeah. You know, that song talked a lot about what was going on in the ghettos, right? Yeah. And, you know, ghetto, unfortunately, has gotten a connotation of uh, the, the connotation of ghetto, unfortunately, has changed in this country. Like this came up on my tour in Italy. when We visited an area called the Jewish ghetto and ghetto is really an ethnic Ethnic group area is all it is, right? And in that case, it was the African American black community that was in there. Uh, but but unfortunately, we've 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 it's kind of gotten stereotyped for the wrong reasons. It's bad neighborhoods, crime, poverty, and that's I don't think that's what a ghetto is. Although Marvin sung about those, you know, the types of issues, mm. the economic effects in there. Um, by the way, we have not we that is an absolute album archaeology. Candidate, oh, what's yeah. going on as an album? By the way, it is it's an amazing, you know, amazing album. You know, that is people consider that one of the greatest albums ever made. Oh yeah, and yeah. Uh, and yeah, and then Marvin and but like Barry Gordy was terrified of that album. He's like, oh. yeah, we ain't released that album. I mean, and he, you know, we're we're you know we're fifty almost fifty four years, fifty three years in with this album. Mm. What you got, Coop? Yeah, I just can't read camera. Okay, I can't read back. Sorry oh, about Coop's that. falling apart. Yep, I was just. Uh, he all thinks right, he's still in Italy. All right, <laughs> I'm st- I'm not getting out of the era either. I'm still back, uh, late fifties, early sixties, and I'm like, I want to do some old school rockabilly to follow this up with, right? Oh, okay. Um, because you know, again, you know, Buddy Holly ushered in the rockabilly, and what what mm-hmm. other artist really kind of was key in the early days of rockabilly was Elvis Presley. Yep. So, I just picked one of my favorite Elvis Presley rockabilly sounding songs, and I went with Mystery Train. Ooh, which I love that. I think it's a good track, by the way. I think that track sometimes gets a little lost in the Elvis it Presley. Definitely uh, does. But it's a good song. You know, it good, definitely gets lost. It's, it's vintage Elvis Presley, as I'll tell people. But, but you know, remember Elvis has rockabilly. You no, know, that's really what he. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Elvis has a lot going yeah. on. I mean, because he has. The rockabilly side of things. He has the like comeback with the black leather Elvis. He's got some some of that, you know, gospel sort of like revival tent sound to him. He has a lot going on, Elvis. Yeah. So uh yeah, I just said let me just pick I'm gonna stick in the rockabilly album, Mystery Chan. I just uh I think it's a cool song. Uh, you know, and it's, if if you're younger and you haven't gone back and you've heard of Elvis, you and you haven't heard this song, go go, go look up it will be on our playlist. Go go check it out. I think it's got, uh, but it's got that rock. I wanted to stick with the rockabilly yeah. vibe with that. Well, so I went from like Caribbean to rockabilly. 
Yeah. I'm I'm quite different. So I was like, so Marvin Gaye sort of was the first to like turn the focus back on domestic issues, especially domestic issues that he saw as facing the African American community, especially. And hip hop picks this up in the nineties where they're like, enough of this, you know, late eighties, nineties, enough of this pop music that says everything's great because it ain't. Uh, this is what life is like. And so I went with them. Ice Cube's America's Most Wanted. Oh, uh, well, that's a big is, change you made. Yeah. It's a big but yeah, change. I see where you kind of kept with the civil theme. Yeah. But it's sort of, you know, in Ice Cube, it's more issues of class, race, the impact of the drug war on communities, police brutality. And it's sort of a similar thing. I try to bring these issues to a wider audience because they thought they were being fairly neglected. Um, by mainstream music and news and stuff like that. So let's try to shed a light on that. Um, now, this is going to... I'm setting up something for later here, Coop. So we're all, when all this stuff came up, it sort of touches on sort of Reagan era 80s where everything's great and everybody's making money. And you, in the pop, the pop music of the 80s kind of like, you know, reflects that. But then when we get to the 90s, people are a bit more disenchanted. And then we have the the recession. And then we get, yeah. you know, Nirvana. And people that are like, life is terrible. So uh, this sort of is like at the forefront of that, of like moving from this, like everything's great, Reagan era 80s to looking at, well, you know, what are some of the social problems? I really, uh, uh, yeah, Dave. I really looked at Reagan era going from like 1980 to 2008. Yeah, because probably. Even under, because even under the Clinton era, it was pretty. Yeah, so it was some economic downturns from time to time, but the Clinton era was pretty prosperous. The Bush era started out prosperous, and then when that economy, that that recession happened right at the end of Bush's president, it changed it changed our country forever. That yeah. was that was huge. The the changes that happened it was widespread, and it and that's when I think it ended. You know, you could say that there were the coattails of Reagan for even through Clinton, but yeah, it came to the yeah. under the under W. Yeah. Well, I think musically too, and Ice Cube kind of talks about this in his song, um, where he has the lyric, uh, "The KKK is wearing three piece suits," which is like one of the best lyrics ever. Wow. Uh, That's a power. And one. it's this it's this idea that like you have predominantly rich white men at these companies yeah. making money at the expense of poor people and minorities. That is it that I'll, I'll touch on a little bit that other artists are going to talk about, but it's this idea of the the poor and stuff getting exploited by these Reagan era like rich people is sort of where the music kind of starts to head. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but it, it seemed like pretty natural for Marvin Gaye to move on to that. And I, I'm going to start going, I'm going to start getting all like, you know, burn it down here, Coop. Oh wow! Bit. Okay. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna be that controversial <laughs> with this one. <laughs> What's your next one here? Man, I this was one I had to think about a little, right? Train, Ooh. mystery train, right? Yeah. And I'm like, train, 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 right? Ooh. And again, the idea with this is what comes to mind with the train. What so, comes to mind, man? So this is a rare time where a music video came to mind, and. Ooh. The music video, because I think it's one of the, I'm not a big music video guy, but when I like a good music video, it sticks with me. And this one was a music video that was filmed on a train. Oh. And uh, it was filmed by five very famous musicians. Uh, actually, actually, four of them were in the video because one died, and that's the Traveling Wilburys, and the song is mm. the end of the line. Great song. Uh, hey, it's the close. Wilburys, another Another album we should be doing, Volume One, as as a uh, yeah. Oh, Volume One's great album. Volume One's great. Volume Three is okay, but Volume One is exceptional. And and I just think a lot of the uh, you know the guys on this. I mean, this is really Petty who drives the vocals in this one a lot. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But but George Harrison when he sings that final verse and he goes, "It's well, it's all right," and it's just classic George Harrison voice in there. But they do the tribute to Roy uh, Orbison, who had died when that video was filmed, mm. and they have the rocking chair with him, you know. Yes. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's an emotional thing for me, uh, because in my opinion, the Wilburys, that album, uh, just 
it was my second favorite album of the year because Hornsby did scenes from the South Side, which I consider legendary. I mean, uh, as far as the Bruce Hornsby album goes, but that was my second favorite album. Eighty eight was a good year for music for me, yeah. So I, I could think... end the yeah end of the line with me. Ooh, great! I think. Well, the volume one is so good, but I think when you look at super groups, I think of that one and I think of the Highwaymen, where it's like the perfect combination of artists. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It was I mean, like, yeah. Because sometimes super groups are a bit thrown together and they don't really work. That's like the perfect, like the Wilburys is like a perfect combination of people that works yeah. really well. Yeah. I thought Power Station worked until Robert Palmer left. And then when you got rid of Robert yeah. Palmer, it died, right? Um. Yeah. Mike and the Mechanics was considered a super group, but it was really Paul Carrick, Mike Rutherford, and session musicians. Uh, so, so I don't really consider that a true super group. It was like they just had, it was more of a collaboration. I looked at with that one, but yeah, I mean, Highwaymen is a great one. Highwaymen is a great one. Temple of the Dog was pretty good. They only put out the one record, but yeah. Um, now, so okay, so I'm talking Reagan. I'm getting really political for whatever reason. Listen to this song. And you can't talk about the impact of Reaganomics and Reagan without talking about Coop's favorite group, the Dead Kennedys. Yeah. So, because you have to, because it's like all the, like... I thought you were going to talk about the Reagan, about the Reagan youth, by the way, which was, a, which was a band, another Oh, Reagan band. youth. Yeah. Nice. He just was a communist. <laughs> great. Oh, there's some great... I saw it on live, actually. I think I told you that, yeah. Reagan's responsible for a lot of great uh, <laughs> American punk. Uh, but so, I mean, the Joe Biafra, the Dick Kennedys, it's all about Reagan, really. Yeah. And you have to have it. So uh, I put Kill the Poor by the Dick Kennedys. Shout out to uh, to Trippy Trent there. This is for you, my friend. Yeah. Uh, but it's like classic. I mean, it's a classic punk song against... Reaganomics and the exploitation of the poor by the rich, and it's—I mean, it's—I mean, it's the song, it's the whole song. So, uh, I kill the poor on. But the oh Kennedys. wow! So we're went, we're at some totally different places now. You you went from I can see clearly now to the dead Kennedys <laughs> to kill the poor. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. Uh, I, different I, vibes. I, yeah, different vibes. I, I, I got to admit, I thought mine was strange, but now your, yours is – then there's wrong, by, by the way. Nothing wrong. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit off the beaten track here. Yeah. yeah. It's going to keep going, Coop, but yeah. I'll, bring, I'll bring it back around. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. So you, so I'm, I'm, I'm like, burned down the system. I'm, like, throwing a fist in the air. I'm, like, you know, Coop's, Coop's rockabillying it. Now Charlie Wilbur is still the good vibes. So where, where yeah. are you at now? I get a little darker. A little. Ooh. Not a lot. Okay. So hmm. it was easy. Five Wilburys. Which Wilbury do I pick, right? Uh, oh, yeah, it yeah, really yeah. came down to Harrison and Tom Petty because I think they're the ones at the end of the line that drive this song. I went with Tom Petty, and I went Ooh. with my all-time favorite Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers song, um, Don't Come Around Here No More. Oh, great song. Uh, now, the video's creepy enough, but even without the video, that's the whole Alice in Wonderland, like, thing yeah but, but forget the video this is kind of a creepy it's got a little bit of creepy vibe uh you know uh and to me this is the song uh that got me into tom petty uh finally you know i would heard some tom Petty, but when this song came out it was like da, 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 don't come around. yeah it's just it's creepy it's it, it, it's and i think that's what this is meant to be but it's, it's a masterpiece by tom petty in my opinion uh the bass work in this song is incredible uh petty's vocal mm. on point uh, and like I said, it showed a very, very different side of Tom Petty, which uh, in that song. So I love that pick. And what I think I like about Tom Petty, well, he's an amazing storyteller. Yeah. A. But B, some of his songs, and a lot of his songs have this sort of little hint of darkness to him. Like even like Last Dance with Mary Jane and stuff. Like this is like, right. yes, yes. Sort of Let's just like a little bit of darkness to yeah. his stuff. Yeah. I mean, not a lot. But yeah. just enough to make it interesting. Yeah. And his vocal is so unique and yeah. I love it. Oh yeah. It to me, this song was um it was it it was a song that didn't really do uh well on the charts, but I wouldn't expect it to do well on the charts. It's not a very radio friendly song. No. Um but the interesting thing about this 
Great song, though. Is it's based, the song is based, and I'll, this is going to play into my next song, on a romantic encounter between Dave Stewart of the Eurythmics and Stevie Nicks of Fleetwood Mac when they, uh, oh, yeah. Um, uh, and, and I guess I remember there was a Dave Stewart interview where he, Dave Stewart said the type, the title of this song was actually uttered by Stevie Nicks to him. Like, don't come around here no more. Nice. You know, and, 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 uh, so, and, uh, yeah. So apparently there was a lot to this song was uh, apparently, uh, and Dave Stewart co-wrote this song with Tom Petty is what's important. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's why it's so, yeah. And I, you know, Teddy's the perfect like with that because you said he brings that darkness. He was the perfect one for it, to to be the lead vocal on this song. Great it's song. kind of psychedelic, a little. It's kind of yeah. I just yeah. I, the, yeah. I mean that was his other thing too, wasn't yeah. it? Really? And Dave Stewart, in my opinion, is a musical genius. In my opinion, he is so underrated. Um, Dave Stewart. So I'm sticking with Punk Coop. I'm going back though. I I got the Clash. This is shout shout outs. Yo-yo. To Sensei, who I know is a listen fan of the show. Yep. Uh, this shout out to you, Sensei. This is off of your favorite album, London Calling. This is the Guns of Brixton. I we talked about that song. We did the album. What a great song that is. It's yeah. So I got the Guns of Brixton, which is sort of like a, the UK version of the Kennedys. Really, it's a very uh, historic song in a lot of ways. Yes. Based on his, yeah. Yeah. So it touches on the riots in Brixton and police yeah, brutality. That's what sort of the Guns of Brixton is about. Now, whereas Ice, so we kind of have Ice Cube who's talking more about exploitation of African American people and like how they're sort of forced into the to the drug war be, in order to like you know break out of that. Uh, Dick Kennedy's talks more about class. Same thing with the class. This is more about class. So it's kind of class wars. And the recession in England, which was a little bit ahead of the recession in the States, I believe. Um, and yeah, especially clashes with the poor. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the clash is very well known for doing a lot of socially uh, activist music. And this is no. And a lot of historically based music as well. They do a couple of songs based on specific riots uh, in England. Uh, White Riot being another one. But. Yeah, Guns of Brixton, Coop. Yeah, Guns of Brixton. I am, I am, I am knee, I'm knee deep. I love that. Great, tearing down I, the system. I, I think it's a great song, by the way, too. Just it's a mess. great song. I think it gets overlooked on that record because that record is just so packed with great songs. But that record almost made won the Coop bracket. <laughs> that Knocked record, out physical it's... graffiti. Yeah, there was a clash movement. There were well, people a... trying. It couldn't get past Led Zeppelin four, so. <sighs> Uh, I mean, that's that's no, you know, yep. Yep. it's nothing to be embarrassed about. But both great records. Mm -hmm. So I am I'm in the middle of a of a class riot right. in my song list. Right. Coop is uh, where where are you, where are you headed? So I'm in like I'm in this zone where uh, you get like, a bit darker, like, a little darker when relationships. You know, like I said, uh, don't come around anymore. It's based on the story of Dave Stewart and Stevie Nicks, but we're gonna stay with Dave Stewart. Okay, we're gonna stay with Dave Stewart. We're gonna go with another Dave Stewart song about about a uh, broken relationship here, mm -hmm. um, and the the song I am picking is um, uh, "Would I Lie to You" by the Eurythmics. Oh, I love so, that song. And, so, what was interesting about this song is when it came out, the Eurythmics they had these hits early on with uh, "Sweet Dreams" and uh, "Here Comes the Rain," very synth pop. Very yes, synth pop. Here comes the rain, yeah. So they do that third album, Be Yourself Tonight, and they change. They go from synth pop, they go to, to more rock and R&B. They have a little Motown vibe with this, Would I Lie to You? And it keeps to my theme of um, broken relations because this uh, this is about basically a cheating lover. Uh, any, it, it's the, from the female point of view, Annie Lennox walking out on a cheating lover. They do a, another good music video was this one, by the way. But yeah, it's just when I heard the and Dave Stewart just absolutely kills it on the guitar with this. His is to me. Oh, I can imagine. He just kills it on this, and it was like I became such a I really became a Eurythmics fan when this song came out because I'm like, wow, they were able to get it, like they were able to just completely change and show a different side of what they're doing here. Um, and another masterpiece by Dave Stewart, songwriting, guitar wise, and he likes his. 
she lives. He, he believes she's throwing out her cheating lover in this song. It, it mm. is great. This song. I love this song. I love that song too. I was just listening to it the other day. Uh, I love Analytics, and I love that song. Her vocal thought, really makes the yeah, remix to me. I thought the RM, I thought the Rock and Roll Fame induction they were a little flat though. I got to be honest with you. Mm, well, yeah. yeah, yeah, I thought they were a little flat with it, but yeah, they were older. Yeah, her vocal really. But oh that, God. Yeah, but there's also a nice Motown vibe with this song. If you're a Motown fan, you oh gotta, yeah, gotta love this song. It just brings everything. But the hard guitars on top of that, and that was a thing back then. You know, Michael Jackson really, I think, played a key role. When 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 Eddie Van Halen does beat it right, I think mm. they they started taking these these R and B songs and now integrating like some good guitar work in, and I think we started yeah that, yeah at this point this was a couple years later than than no, that's that, that's a yeah. good point yeah. yeah. I now okay, so I'm in England right in England. listening to the Clash, uh, and I'm like I gotta you know as much as I want to tear down the system I've been tearing down the system for seven songs now I gotta kind of move on with my life. Uh, and I've been watching Get Back, Coop, lately. Have you seen that the the Get the Beatles thing? I gotta watch it again. I'm due to watch it again. I see. I thought they did. A, I mean, incredible, incredible. What I'm gonna tell what I'm gonna tell people is that I'm sort of like a little bit, a little bit past casual Beatles fan. You gotta re. I mean, to really get a lot out of it, you gotta really like the Beatles because it is a <laughs> there's a lot. Um. But it's crazy. Like the crazy parts of it is how they make their songs. It'll just be like Paul McCartney on the bass. Like I've been thinking of the song and he's just playing. They're just playing chords. and He's just seeing nonsense just sort of because they like a chord. And it turns into get back and all this stuff. Yeah. Which is crazy. Well, that I mean, the fact that they had all that footage, it was amazing. It was like I mean, 60 hours. Yeah. I mean, the fact that it took that long to get something together with that is surprising. They were sitting on it for, for 50 years almost. Yeah. And you get everything. You get them. You get them demoing and making up classic songs. You get the band falling apart. You get the most George iconic Harris. concert yeah. in rock and roll history. Like you get it all. Yeah. Um. Right now they're kind of feeling the pressure of writing songs. Yep. And the other thing that comes out of the get back is that everybody loves Ringo. Everybody in the band loves Ringo. All the band's partners love Ringo. Everybody loves Ringo. Okay. Ringo, thing. Ringo, it's not just the band. He's beloved in the music industry. I mean, you see, like, you see with the All Star Band, he's done, which he's done a. Gr- I've been to the All Star Band concerts and I've watched them, and he's beloved. He really is. He's the most beloved Beatle for sure. He's he's Everybody the weak Beatle. Yes, he's the weak Beatle, but yeah, he's but he, yeah, he's beloved. He's the glue man. Everybody loves Ringo. Yeah. Uh, so I've been so I I went to a song, probably my favorite song off of that concert and I have the concert version is I got a feeling. My and favorite, sort of that's st- one of my favorite Beatles songs. Oh my good. I, that's I a love memorable this song. Beatles song. Oh. So oh, and they oh, kind of start I love this they, song, yeah. They kind of start get back with Lennon sort of toying around with the song. And it's yeah. sort of like a through line throughout the thing. They they kind of keep coming back to this song over and over and over. And it's sort of like Kind of like runs throughout the the, the documentary, um, and it's such a great song. On the song list, I'll put both the live version and the studio, so you can compare them. But what's interesting about this is Harrison, like Coop's talking about Harrison a lot, which is one of my favorite Beatles, and he was talking in the documentary about like how the Beatles need to get back to their their roots of being subversive, and they've gotten too complicated. And they need to sort of get back to, you know, what used to make them them and kind of get out of this rut that they're in. Uh, Which is kind of the driving force behind these songs. And it's sort of the driving force behind doing the rooftop concert at all. Because they're like, well, what's more subversive than doing a concert that no one knows about? They just sort of like put on the street. Um, And and it's great. And I think the other thing that's cool, Coop, just one last thing about this record and this is like, this is after they stopped touring, and they just, and this is right back to when they're like, well, let's play music live again. So when they stopped touring, their songs got really complicated because they never had to play them live. They yeah. didn't have to worry about playing them. So they would do all this overdubbing and all this stuff because, like, we don't have to play it. So this is the first time they went back to, like, constructing songs around playing them live, which is interesting as well. 
Um, but no, yeah, I got a feeling. I love that song. Listen, you know, I, I, I know this song. It, you know, I don't know if you know this was a this was a mashup pretty much. They did. They took they took McCartney had the original. I got a feeling, and Lennon had this. Uh, yeah. I, everybody's got a hard year. And they match oh. it up, and then, then they bring Billy Preston in. This was recorded yes. for the Rooftop concert. You know, for all the criticism of the Let It Be album, this, to my opinion, this is the best Beatles song ever done. If I had to pick one Beatles song that I take to my grave, it's this. This is such a genius. And this is like them, you know, the whole story of that in this documentary is amazing. I, I think this is an amazing, amazing song. I've heard, I've heard McCartney's perform this one live, too. Yeah, I have it's, heard him perform it, yeah. It's, a, it's, I it's, think. Yeah, it's a great song. I think too, Coop, really quick, and then we'll move on to your stuff, is that I think watching this, if you're a Beatles fan, even a casual Beatles fan, you get a lot more appreciation of the get back of the of the of that record. Yep. The the that that final record. Because like you will like these songs are all just bangers. <laughs> They're all so good. Yeah. Um, and this is oh yeah, and the other thing is you know we criticized Phil Spector. Phil Spector was key getting this song together. As a yeah, producer. I mean, he really was yeah. The thing too about it that comes through is just how musically talented they are. Because like, there's this there's a shot of these people moving in an organ, like bringing an organ into where they're rehearsing. Yeah, and McCartney's like, "What's with the organ?" And. uh and Harrison's like, oh, I got this song that's only a couple of chords. I thought if someone played an organ, it would be perfect. And Lennon plays the organ, and it's perfect. Like, it yeah. sounds amazing. <laughs> it's just like... Yeah. Man, it's just please, so, it's I, so good. I could do a whole episode on this. On This This is how good a song it is. I, to me, this is like a masterpiece by the Beatles and wasn't meant to be a masterpiece and how it came together. And I uh, just love this song top to bottom. Love it. Well, this is like, I don't know how I'm going to top anything you now tonight. It's This is so good. Oh, well, hey. There you go, Coop. So I, I I have somehow gone from, like, the height of punk to now Coop's favorite song. I'm, I'm like, in music, the Sistine Chapel of music here. Where yeah. are you at, Coop? All right. When, in the song, Would I Lie to You, by the Eurythmics, which was my last song, uh, they use... You know, outside, they use sound effects in this song. And one of the sound effects they use is a motorcycle. So it's sounding like Annie Lennox is getting on the motorcycle and taking off on on her boyfriend, right? So I had the motorcycle theme in mind. We just did the car show, and I'm like, what what do I do, right? So there's lots of motorcycle songs. Mm -hmm. Um, I went with actually uh, one that's – it is a motorcycle song. But many people don't think of it. it. It didn't make our car show because it wasn't quite. It was more about the motorcyclist than the uh, than the motorcycle. And uh, that is Greg Allman, Midnight Rider. Oh, nice. The Midnight Rider, which I think is. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I think there's Greg Allman. I think Greg Allman's the originator of that one. I think then, then the Allmans took it in. Uh, another masterpiece. Uh, t- shout out to Tuner on that one. Yeah, Tuner's uh, gonna love this one. Yeah, the Midnight Rider to me. Uh, it it's. It, I would say it's the Allman Brothers is technically the one here. So, but I, I but but uh, I I think it's also been used on a solo thing by Greg Greg Allman. Um, I'm sure and, it has. Uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, Greg Allman's came out after the, this one as well. Um, I've even heard a Jamaican version of this song, and I think Willie Nelson did this song as well. I'll pro- oh, it's a total will. I hope yeah. he did. But it's kind of it, it kind of brings that whole uh it doesn't like you think of the more loneliness of the motorcyclist here with this one. So yeah. uh in kind of the lonely motorcycle, uh but but what a what a it, it to my opinion, this is just Almonds and Greg Allman at his best here. Um it, it's just another masterpiece. Um and you know, I've I've seen Allman do, I've seen the Allman Brothers, I've seen them do this song live, and it is uh, it is an incredible track. Uh, it's it's a it, it's a little scaled back, but um, but to me the uh great lyrics um, and um, I the, the lyrics in this song are just amazing. Yeah, mm. is, uh, so yeah, Midnight Rider. So, Coop kind of talked about it earlier. But part of 
Harrison coming back to the group. He just like left the group over lunch, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and when they come back from lunch, the group is just in chaos. So what he had a couple stipulations about when he would how he would come back. One of them is that they moved to Apple Studios, which they did. Yep. Which is why you have the rooftop on top of Apple Apple's, Studios. Yep. Um which is good because it made for one of the most iconic concerts of all time. Uh, and the other one is that they brought in Billy Preston, he, who George yeah. Harrison talks about a lot during the documentary. Yeah. And how he likes, he saw him play with Ray Charles and how he loves him. So I have a Billy Preston track. I have Billy Preston out of space. Oh, that's a kind of a real deep wonder, yeah. Which is a bit, it's a bit, it's a kind of in the funky vibe, funky, like, like Starship funk kind of vibe. But yeah, a bit, a bit of Billy Preston. Died young. Died at 60. Yeah. Died young, yeah. Uh, he was but, with, he did do a couple of tours with the Ringo Starr All-Star Band, though. Well, Harris, Harrison loved him. Harrison loved him, yeah. But Out of Space but, won a Grammy, I believe. It, it people forget about Out of Space because they, you know, they think uh, there's other so nothing from nothing. Is like what people think. Yeah, of. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, but yeah, Ooh, yeah. A little bit deeper. It's gonna set up for a song that I think you'll enjoy, Coop, as well. Yeah. But what uh, what's your next one here? Well, I think you'll like. I think you. I think you'll like this. So, <laughs> I went with something. That, I know Dave, you love this, right? Because I went oh, with one of go. your favorite albums. Oh Jesus. Right. Midnight. Theme of Midnight. Here we go. Oh, here we go. The Midnight Rambler by the Rolling Stones. Ah. On the Let It Bleed album, an absolute masterpiece. We've talked about this when we did when we did the album. It was the first album of archaeology we did. Uh to me, this song is just amazing. It's it's an this is just an epic poem by the uh, by the Rolling Stones. Excuse me. Oh yeah. It's just it's an epic poem. It's the whole story of the Boston Strangler. Uh Lyrically, I think it's some of the best Rolling Stones stuff they did. Musically, I think it's some of the best stuff they did. It is just, uh, it, it, if you want, it's it's Rolling Stones doing storytelling so well here, uh, mm. and it just how the beat changes up in this song and everything. It's just, uh, it's a masterpiece. And it was like I said, Midnight. It was easy, Midnight Rambler here. Nice. Gotta love some stuff from Let It Bleed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sensei is gonna be very divided on this show. Uh oh, because we got we got let it bleed, but we also got London Calling. So I wonder how he's gonna go. Yeah, I know. Throw some U two in there. That's right. Yeah, like, he, you know. he throws some U two, and then he doesn't like <laughs> uh he does not like the reflex. By the way, by Duran Duran. Oh, that's right. Does he like Blondie? I can't remember if he liked Blondie or didn't. I like think Blondie. he likes. I think he likes Blondie. I think so, but I'm, yeah, that's a good. I'll he seems check. like he'd like Blondie. Uh, anyway, I want to go something funky. Uh, this this track it's a bit funky, a bit jammy. We've been talking about this band as of late. It's a bit of a jam band. It's the band Fish Coop. Oh, more fish with the with the track Wolfman's Brother. What a great track that is! Off of Junta. Junta. Great track. It has a bit of. I think it has a bit of a funk vibe to it. You know. Yeah. Oh, definitely. So yeah, Wolfman's Brother. This this album was just huge for them. Yeah. Um, Great. And I remember, like when it came out, like these songs were like everywhere. They uh, not only that, they do some great jams off this album. Oh yeah, they really do. Um, and uh, they uh, was it on the Hooter album or Hoist album? Oh, Hoist. Sorry, not Hooter. Yeah, I think it was a Hoist my, album. My, yeah. My apologies. That's okay. They're pretty. You know, I know those. Yeah, they uh. They also have, it's also on, they, they, you know, they release a lot of that. You go to live fish and get concerts of theirs, right? But sometimes they do live albums that they just mainstream. And if you get an album called Slip, Stitch, and Pass, uh, Wolfman's Brothers on there as well. Um, and uh, Wolfman's Brothers is actually a song that was written by all four members of Fish. Really? Yeah. It's, you know, so they don't, you know, they, they tend to collaborate or do solo, but this is a one of the few that they actually all credit as songwriters on. All right. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, definitely an absolute classic. Um, Some great jams they build off that one as well. Mm. So what do you got here, Coop? Well, that's what my last one, I think, right? Finishing out. Well, closing it up. You know, 
the Midnight Ramble is a song about Albert DeSalvo, who's confessed to being the Boston Strangler. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. So okay. I said I'm going to stick with Boston. And oh. uh, I didn't go with the song I originally wanted to go with because we talked a lot about it. Uh, but I went with a Boston song, but I did not go with Peace of Mind because I could not trip trip with oh, that. Right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I went with I went with. Look, I think it's an absolute power ballad song, in my opinion. It's the song that put Boston on the map. It's more than a feeling. Nice. Uh, yep. Um, you know that's just some great, great vocals and some great guitar work. Uh, like I said, it's a like Peace of Mind is the better song, and Trip and analyzing wow. the roots of that song is is masterful. But more than a feeling is is an absolute another man. We would not be talking about Boston if it wasn't for more than a feeling. Oh no, yeah. So I, I yeah wrapped it up with Boston, kind of a safe chalk pick. I went with that because uh, I was trying to think of another like you know Boston strangle character. I couldn't really come up with a song with that, so I stuck to chalk and went with Boston. Nice. Hey, nothing wrong with that. Yep, my friend. Yep, boy. Um, we went from, I went from I can see yeah. clearly now a positive song to you know. The Boston Strangler at some point, but yeah, I kind of yeah, came back. Yeah, out you little, you took a little, left turn in there, man. Yeah, because I got a little darker towards the end of that. Yeah, but you came you came you came back in the kind of came back. Uh... Kind of a little more of an optimism type of of close, you know, a little full circle, but not not the uh, I could Johnny Nash version. Yeah, no. So yeah. what I've been what I've been doing lately is when we do these rabbit holes, I think to myself. What is like the opposite of the first song that right. I can do? Like, like what is the song that is the is the most opposite of the opening song um, that I could put on here? And so I was thinking about it, and I was like, well, you know, it's got to be, um, uh, it has to be like newer obviously, because uh, this is an older song, so it's got to be a newer song. And, it can, you know, it's got to it's got to have some sort of electronic thing in it. Right. So I went with Charlie XCX. And I went with uh, Sympathy is a Knife. Wow. It's the, the title of my song. So Charlie XCX, she put out Brat which, you know, is kind of the album of the summer. And it's very sort of like clubby. Uh, and it's not it's this this song's a bit it's a bit like cold. It's not as warm as um, as, uh, you know, the, the I can see clearly now. Uh, but, you know, I I was like, let's. What's the the total opposite? And I came up with uh, Charlie XCX. So this, so there you go. I heard Kamala playing this. Uh, the I, I thought I heard Kamala playing some of this music. Really? Yeah, I may be wrong. On, uh, yeah, a bit of bit of Charlie XCX. Why is this? I'm wondering if Brad's gonna get Grammy consideration. Uh. I mean, it sold a ton. I don't know if that'll have anything to do with it. I mean, it'll because get nominated a, for sure. I, I, you think it gets nominated for one of the big awards? Album of the year, maybe. I mean, I don't know if it'll win it, but like, it just sold so much, Coop. It's just so everywhere. Yeah. That I think, I think they'll throw it in there. It's I a mean, good album. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting album, and I think, uh, I've heard this album, and uh, it's kind of, it's very, uh, it's a very good album. Actually, it seems like it. Draws a lot of different influences in it as well. But yeah, a little Charlie XCX. So yeah, I kind of went. Let's see what where how I did here. I, I went very saying, yeah. I went very uh, fight the power for the first, and then I and then I hit the Beatles, and then I just sort of like hit Billy Preston, and just sort of kind of got out of it. Yeah, I I kind of went back in time. Yeah. Right. I went back in time, and then um, I went dark. I yeah. Went dark, I, you know, from when I went to the, you know, don't come around here no more. Oh, that. Uh, yeah. Would I lie to you? Is not exactly a positive song. Not necessarily dark, but uh, you know, midnight <laughs> it's rambler. Not the best message. Mid, uh, yeah. You know, midnight midnight rider, midnight rambler. Then I kind of went with a little more optimism, like more than a feeling. Kind of is, 
I, I kind of like the full circle thing that I tend to do. Like, I can see clearly now there's this optimism theme, and more than a feeling has this optimism theme, too, uh, as well. So yeah. I kind of I tried to come a little full circle with that. Nice. Yeah. No, ah, great rabbit hole. Love it. That was a really good one. Yeah, this is like, <laughs> this is our way of kind of doing a DJ. Um, it's interesting how, where these go. Yeah, I, I thought I went weird this time because I went down this dark pass, but you you definitely uh, you did a good job with that too. Yeah, these are gr- these are great tracks, by the way. It's not a bad track you had. I got to be honest with you, this was a good good, good one. So, new music forty five here, Coop. Yes, uh, brought to you by our friends at Cigar Hustler, located in Deltona, Florida. Uh, great retail store, and I can't say enough mm-hmm. about it. Um, great. Great uh, customer service, great lounge, and a great humidor where you can find boutiques, tried and true cigars um, as well. They host events there. If you can't get down to Deltona, Florida, go to CigarHustler.com. Get on their email list. Follow them on social media. They got a lot of limited stuff in, and they post it on their social media, and they also put in internet um, to do that. Uh, of course, they have the Postani brand. Um, which you know, some very, very good cigars that they have on that. Um, again, I don't think they have a bad cigar either. Uh, they no. even have some that are like off the cup limited, like the BDP you smoked, the uh, Bangarang, which I smoked recently, which was you did really they do good cigars, they do good work. And, and as much as we bust on those guys, they're good guys, so uh, I think we all do it. In 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 in, in, in uh, they, they drove me a little crazy this week, I gotta be honest with you, but uh. Ah. Uh, but they also went after Jack Tarano, so I, I didn't feel bad either. So, so, hey, yeah, no. So, uh, but yeah, um, as well, and then of course, and then we're talking about their uh, Cigar Hustlers podcast, probably the most unusual podcast in the cigar industry. Yes, well, that's true. Yep, that is definitely true. Yep. Um, let's do it app. Yep, they're getting a lot of CAO there, by the way. At, yeah. Uh, yes, they do. At the uh, yeah, so that's exciting. Yep, for them. Agree. Um, love love your tracks this week. By the way. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well. Okay. So Coop obviously will love these tracks because we got. Uh, first up, Pet Shop Boys. This is a great track. Feel title track to the new EP. They love putting out EPs, Coop. For some reason. They do. They do. I mean, just just wait a little bit longer, guys, and put out a record if you got all these EPs. Well, well, listen, the one thing that people don't realize, uh, the Pet Shop Boys, uh, Neil Tennant just turned 70. He's not oh, okay. a, uh I think not Chris Lowe is, is like 65. But but so they're they're getting up there. Neil Tennant's like 70 right now. Um and uh you know they they uh it, it's you know they 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 love these they love their like I said, uh the album we're talking about, uh or the EP we're talking about is nonetheless, but um I think there's ten songs on that album, which will qualify for. A I'd group. have to look. I may be wrong. Uh, uh, but, but we I got we got feel. What a great track! It's fun. It's a bit clubbier than their previous stuff. So, like that lost that we did a little while ago. So no, great song. Could still put on good music. Yeah. If you're, I, I mean, what do you think, Coop? If you're a Pet Shop Boys fan, you really like this stuff. You're gonna love this song. Uh, you're really gonna love it. Um, and by the way, this was a ma- This has been a really. It's gotten really good commercial success, and it's gotten really oh, good, good. Uh, reviews, as well. But there's a lot of different formats, and I think that's why the EP version. Um, maybe there's several formats they put this yeah. out, but there is a ten one. I just got to uh... see if that qualifies because I know they've done some. They've done new recordings of like "It's a Sin" and "Always on My Mind" and stuff. That's why. It means- All right. Okay. Um. But, um, I I gotta say, yeah, feel it's it's a really really uh you I think in your notes you really nailed exactly uh what this song is is about. Mm. It, it's got that clubby vibe you look for. Yeah. 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 Uh, now before we get to the next one, how's the cigar? Not bad. Pretty good. Um. You know, like I said, you got me thinking about this barbecue note now a bit. Yeah. Which I hadn't thought about before. Uh, and then maybe a, I'm wondering if there if this cigar is fire cured or not now. You got me I, I don't with know. The, with the, I with mean, the, art, with the Argent, whatever that tobacco is. I don't want to say it's Argentinian because yeah. I don't know that. But whatever that mystery tobacco is, uh, it's 
it definitely goes. If there's any creaminess early on, it's gone now. Oh yeah, yeah. I uh, no, I really like the cigar. I think it had a bit more body than I was expecting. Not strength wise, like strength well, is what you think. Yeah, there's definitely body on this cigar. It's medium plus for sure, closer to medium to full even. Um, I had a bit of like that charred barbecue note, but now Coop, as I'm getting further along, it gets a bit metallic. Yeah, that makes a, sense. There's a little metallic, a little mustiness. Uh, the Aaron, yeah, Aaron likes it. Um, it's definitely not your cookie cutter Connecticut shade cigar. No, no. And and look, I give I give CLE a lot of credit here. They did something different for the PCA exclusives. They like a lot of these companies. They check a box. They'll put out a size. There's nothing exciting about. It. Yeah, this is something different. These these cigars are different. Um, I have, yeah, like I said, I think this is better than the, I've had the, uh, Aroa one with the Corolla. I think this one's better. I haven't had the Asylum one yet. I got to smoke that one. No, it's a good cigar. Um, yep. But yeah, like I said, just near the end, it's getting a bit metallic. So I'm kind of like, mm, but no, nah, it was good. I really liked it. Um, side B. This is for Coop Soccer Mommy. Yes. She has a new track out called M. This is a single off her upcoming record, Evergreen. This is back to her sort of in- indie singer-songwriter roots. So we talked about Shotgun earlier. That's a bit rockier. This is a bit more back to, like, you know, yeah, singer-songwriter yeah. type stuff. Indie, like you said that in the notes. Indie. Yeah, more a bit of closer indie to, yeah. like, her original stuff, her early yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. So check check that out if you like Soccer Mommy. Yep. And if you like Soccer Mommy, album archaeology homework, one of her early records, Clean. This is where she first came on Rye Radar because Pitchfork really liked the song on this record. Um, this is totally that indie sound that she's sort of going back to, so it's good to sort of check it out, see, see her song is her sound has sort of evolved and gone back and forth. So this is sort of good to see kind of the roots, the roots of stuff. So yep, if you well, like she, that Soccer Mommy track, you'd like this album. She got a new album coming out, by the way. Yeah, yeah, Evergreen. Evergreen. Check yep. it out. There's another single out as well. Yep. I don't know when it's coming out, but. Yep. Yep. Out. Yeah, she's really, really good. Yeah, and you got a bonus here, Coop. Yes. Um, Sheila E has recently put out a new album, and I'm really digging this album because it's salsa. Ooh, and it's called Baila, and it's Sheila E doing salsa, collaborating with some salsa artists. Uh, fantastic album. Uh, you know, salsa is a New York thing. It's not a Minneapolis sound thing, right? So this is no. a, little, a little different venture. So you know, the funny thing is, here's how I got into. It. Here's what happened. Okay, this here's is what happened. okay. Here's what happened. So I was in um, I was in uh Venice, okay, and yeah. you know, in Venice, um, they Saint there's Saint Marco, which is Saint Mark's place, um, and uh. I, I look. That's the Bella Saint Mark is a song of hers. Okay, about you know it. It, it basically uh, um, it it pays homage to uh. I it pay I think it pays homage to Saint Mark's in Paris for some reason, right? But whatever it is, I think there's a connection. The bell is the bell tower in Saint Mark's Square. Uh, the other thing is that there is a Saint Mark's uh cathedral in Minneapolis, right? So I think that yes. also was the inspiration. I think there's and there may be bells there. But I started getting on a little Sheila E kick when I was on the balcony in Rome and, and was smoking on the balcony in Venice. And uh I didn't mm. realize she had this album out. And I'm like, this is a great album, by the way. It's it's you know, I know a lot of people in the cigar industry like salsa. This is she did tremendous percussion works tremendous on Oh it. yeah. It's time to start considering her for Hall of Fame. It's time. I know she may not she may not have the commercial record to do it, but she's She's such a good, she's such a good percussionist that I think mm. it's, it's time. Yeah. So. Yeah, you think out. so? Yeah, check out that album, by the way. By the way, the the uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the extended version on the album, it's fantastic. Yeah. And by the way, that was okay. Bella. Uh, you know, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going back to the Bell. The Bella Saint Marks another song. You know, bonus track to check out as well. That's not from the Bayar album, but yeah. It's funny in. Uh... In that documentary on the the We Are the World or whatever, Sheila E talks about like the only reason they asked her to do it is try to get Prince to do it. Yeah, yeah, that was a great documentary, by the way. Uh, 
Um, you know, a lot of people asked me if my dad drove any of the artists out. That was an L.A. thing. It wasn't a New York thing. Uh, so he yeah. wasn't out there, yeah. But, you know, um, but there were so many of the artists my dad knew, who, like Cindy Lauper, Michael, you know, but no, he was he had nothing to do with that, yeah. Or driving, he had nothing to drive. I mean, he had nothing to do with any of that. But he, you know, he would drive people. But that was that was an L.A. recording session. Yeah. Was, yeah. Oh yeah, that was crazy. Yeah. yeah, check that out. Yeah. Um, that's all I got, Coop. That's all I got. Um, so stay tuned to our schedule. I know you have some travel coming up. I do. Uh, but uh, stay tuned to our schedule for that. Uh, and if you're a Battle of the Bands prize winner, we you ha you guys have been selected. And I said to everyone that would be let mailed out the last week in August. Uh, but my travel kind of delayed everything. But I so I so those will be mailed out this week. So nice. uh, check that out. Then I think we have an album archaeology scheduled for the fall with with Hector and John. Yes. Yeah. To to finish that out. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, no, good show. I always love doing the rabbit hole. Thank you, Dave. Thanks to our audience as well. Uh, that's going to wrap up Primetime Duke Rock episode 138 into the annals of history for this late August 2024. We'll catch everybody on the B-side. Take care, everybody.